Hello everyone and welcome once again to Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley. Still in the year 1369, which is fine. <laughs> we aren't 1368 anymore, so I'm good with that. Silverfall, Stories of the Seven Sisters. So this is at Greenwood, and I know I said I probably wouldn't go back to Greenwood until Elminster and Hell, but I figured, why not? This is a, a, a book that doesn't have anything to do with Elminster, at least not up front. And, uh, you know, it... it I thought it was actually seven unconnected short stories, so I thought this this would be a good way to get kind of a taste of Greenwood stuff. I'll say this much, I liked it better than anything that I've read from him so far, but his writing style just still really grates on me. Passive voice all over the place and these kind of little nudge-nudge wink-winks to the reader that just doesn't work for me. They were fewer in this one, for sure. And I was interested in the plot, because the plot is basically that there's a, uh, that there are drow invading society using kind of masks, magical charms, whatever, so that they look like normal humans. And there's this whole subculture of them out there. The little bit that we see of them from the bit that I read, they don't seem to be, like, planning a takeover or whatever, so what's going on with them? Somebody who's read the book, let me know, because I didn't get that far through it. I got, like, two of the seven short stories through and just finally had to put it down because I was like, I cannot take any more of this. Also, it was like, it's all about Mistra's like seven chosen or whatever they're called. Um, and it kind of goes from one to the next, to the next, to the next. And it's all just so telegraphed and obvious. Nothing, it seems like everything's meant to be like, aha, you know, <laughs> like Ed's like sitting around the table, like with this devious glint in his eyes as the party goes through these little things and then he's like, aha, every time that something happens. And it's like, no, we got it, Ed. We're not stupid. Like, we're there with you. Please stop. Like, ah, like, it's like, okay, I get that some of the characters, like at one point a character thinks that this chick is being attacked. So he's like, oh, I'm going to help her out. And he like goes in running pell-mell. And of course she's just practicing or whatever, because she's like, what a mistress chosen, you know, like a couple of I don't, I don't even remember what they were, like ice imps or something aren't going to really hurt her. And it's like, okay, I get that, but to have it go so much from his point of view and make it feel as if the author is trying to trick you into thinking that this is going to happen, that just got really frustrating, did not work for me. But as I say, I did like the plot, and I made it farther through it than I have through any of other Greenwood, any other Greenwood stuff. So, hey, improvement, right? The Glass Prison by Monty Cook. Also skipping this. Very frustrating in a lot of ways because Monty Cook, I mean, come on. I, I liked his Tallis comic. I loved a lot of the stuff that he wrote on the side for Tallis. Tallis the book itself <laughs> was so monumental that I don't think I even uh, scratched the surface of that sucker. I wanted to play a game set in there, but that's kind of the problem with uh, releasing something towards the end of a release cycle is that probably everybody's looking to try something else at that point. Absolutely love the idea of Tallis, though, making a, a city that's a living city that you could play in. I mean, it seems like that should be doable for, say, Waterdeep, right? I don't know why that hasn't been done. Maybe it was in 2nd edition. I'm not that clear with what came out in 2nd edition. I'm not that familiar with it. I think there is a Waterdeep box set, so maybe you could do that with that. But still, Tallis, just a, a ton of great ideas in that set. All somewhat tangential. I don't even remember <laughs> what this book started out with. That's how just unimpressive it was to me and it was very uh very sad because as i say i i've liked most of monty cook's stuff i think he has a lot of great ideas seems to really enjoy the worlds that he works in but for whatever reason just did not gel for me oh yeah i vaguely remember now there was like a, a tiefling or something running away from hell and he got to the prime material plane and I, I remember with the other characters like their parents had died and he told us everything about that incident then like the next chapter we see a flashback where that incident happens, and it was like, you just needed one or the other. You don't need both. And there was a lot of overwriting in that sense in that book. I don't know what it is with Realms writers and overwriting. It seems like it's a common thing in fantasy just in general. Maybe the Realms in specific, possibly because at first they were meant for kind of a younger adult audience. I, I think they're going for a little bit older at this point. Um, I think if they started out like 13 to 14, they're now around 16, 17. I'm not really sure... It's, it's so tough for me to tell some of these things because, honestly, if you have a really, really, really well-written young adult novel, who cares, right? I mean, it's still good. Just because it might be a little shorter, a little straighter, to the point and not deal with certain issues, that doesn't make it a bad book or lesser in my eyes. Uh, plenty, plenty, plenty of great young adult novels out there. 
but they're also really horribly written young adult novels. Most of them are overwritten in much the same way that a lot of the ones we're skipping here are. Pool of Radiance, The Ruins of Myth Draenor. Also sad because we're skipping that, and I love, love, loved all the Pools books so far. You guys know that. You've been with me for a while. You know that I've been digging the Pools books. Yeah, this one just, wow. I, uh, again, I don't remember anything about this one, and I'm racking my brain here. Yeah, nothing. Just that it was bad. It was really, really bad, and, uh, sorry. Couldn't make it through it. Technically, Crucible is next on the list, but let's go through a couple that I have kind of less to say about first and get those out of the way. Master of Chains. So I was excited about this. This is a uh, kind of third edition book uh, published in the time of third edition, came out during those years, but set in second edition. So I was really curious to see why. Jess LeBeau, I've read a few things by him, really like him, think he's great at action scenes and usually has fun stuff that's quick to read. So I was excited about that. No idea why this was set in second edition. No need for it to be, not really sure why it was put there by the uh, person who runs the page that I follow for the dates. Doesn't seem like the date really matters. No idea where it was set. They kept saying it over and over again, but I couldn't find it in any of the uh, indexes, indices. Um, any of the 3rd uh, or 4th edition Forgotten Realms books that I had. Couldn't find it on the map. I think at one point they mentioned that they're decently close to Tether, so I guess in the southish. I don't know. And it's just a very forgettable book, which is sad because the first half or so, really, really good. A lot of great buildup. There are two brothers who are kind of forced by fate down almost diametrically opposite paths. Very, very different paths. Let's put it that way. And you keep kind of like looking forward to this final confrontation between the two of them because essentially one is working for the enemy now. They were both resistance fighters and one works with the enemy and he's dating the uh, one, the other one's wife, uh, blah, 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 blah. And in the end, it's just all kind of thrown out the window. It's just like, oh, hey, we're here. Let's just all fight together. So uh, that was a annoying and frustrating and difficult to deal with because it was like you set up such this great like Shakespearean tragedy and in the end it's just kind of like bad boys too you know it, it just all of a sudden it's like it's just about like this dude has like chains hanging off of him and he's become the master of chains and I I don't know I mean I I guess it was just a big who cares it wasn't bad it was a fun read it went by quickly I can't say I didn't enjoy it but it was very, very, very let down by the ending. I've said a multiple number of times, probably on here too, that I'll take a weak third act as long as we have a strong first and second. This didn't exactly have a strong first and second. It had a promising first and second, and then just nothing for the third act. And there was this sequel, or not sequel, uh, epilogue that really, really felt like it was setting up a sequel, and as far as I know, this has not been sequeled. So, that was also frustrating. This is just a very frustrating book. I mean, if you just want something fun, fast, easy to read, go for it, but don't get your hopes up for any sort of resolution that means anything, or makes you care, or matters. Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Om. That's right, we're in Om, and things are ominous and impressive, if you will. So, uh, yeah, what's his name? Aladrak or whatever is back, and he is once again fighting the bad guys and being really, really angry. So again, even though this one came out second, it's placed third in the chronology on here, uh, but the all the stuff that happens in this is what they were referencing at the beginning of the other one that I tried to read earlier by Drew Cap Shaken or what, how, whatever his name is. So I don't really get why this one is third, unless the other one starts out like that and it's like, hey, remember that time blah, 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 blah happened? Not sure. The uh, fun thing about this one is it had more characters that I remembered from the game, like Minsk and uh, Boo and Imowen. That was nice. That's mostly what kept me reading through this because, like the first one, it's crap. But it's so ridiculously bad that it just drags me in. And Athens' writing is so readable that I just kept reading it. But it doesn't matter. Nothing matters at all. I don't know, but Athens does, like, stuff that doesn't matter in such a way that it almost feels like noir to me. Like, th there's this great bit early on where uh, Abdel, that's his name, Abdel is like, he slices through, or no, he tries to slice through a guy and he has to chase him, and the guy was, like, with a whore, and the whore looks at him and shrugs. And it's just this very human moment that's very confused and chaotic and doesn't fit, and it's like... It's such a great little moment. You can tell that the person who's writing this is talented. But the story itself is like, what? 
I mean, it's all about, like, Adel and Emelyn turning into giant beasts and rampaging, and then they're fighting in the elven tree of life because some bad guy wants to become immortal, and it's like, what? I don't... And then, like, Adel is sucked into the ground, but he's pulled out and saved by the power of love or something, and just nothing's been resolved. There are still these kind of, is Abdel a good guy or a bad guy, and what does it all mean, and la di da di da none of that gets resolved. Nothing really goes anywhere. It's just, they fight and kill a lot of people. This one, not as many companions get murdered brutally. So... I guess if you were down, if you found that a downer in the first book, then it's not there in this book. So yay! All right, let's talk about having an ironic conceit around which most of your novel revolves. It might sound like a lot of technical jargon there or whatever, but you know, basically we're talking about just a, a simple idea where you have one. I don't want to call it joke because it's not always done as a joke, except in the worst of cases, <laughs> around which everything kind of depends. This is as old as say a Connecticut Yankee and King Arthur's Court, or the modern equivalent Army of Darkness. You know, you have a story and everything in it depends upon the fact that one thing doesn't match up. That is what. Crucible, Trial of Siric the Mad, easily could have devolved into. Let me tell you why. Here's the basic story. Siric is put on trial with the gods because essentially Mistra is like, he's cheating and doing all this bad stuff, blah, 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 blah. Which, of course, he's the god of lies and murder. And so this book is about so many different things, one of which is that uh, Midnight as Mistra just isn't getting it quite yet. So he's put on trial. To counteract the fact that he is the god of lies and murder, Mistra basically sneaks into the courtroom beforehand and casts this spell that forces everyone who's in there to tell the truth. What she doesn't realize is that Siric has sneaked in one of his devout followers who's he's, who he's gonna get to help him uh, during this whole endeavor. And since he's just a mortal, the spell cast upon him acts as a permanency spell because it's so powerful to affect gods. So there's this follower of Siric who is cursed, essentially, to always tell the truth. Siric reveling in this and realizing that he's his perfect agent because he's completely devout and he can never lie to Siric makes him the Seraph of Lies. This is the central conceit that drives every interaction in the rest of the novel, basically, because he's the Seraph of Lies, he cannot lie, and he's trying to do what Siric wants him to do, which is find the Saranashad, that book that I talked about in Prince of Lies, that essentially, if you read it, you'll be brought over or converted to believing in Siric's way. Basically, Siric wants to find this book because all that's in circulation right now is the fake book that got written in uh, Prince of Lies. So Siric wants to find the real book that does have the spell in it that will make anyone who listens to it believe in Siric and have it read as a piece of evidence in the courtroom, thus causing all the other gods to follow him and giving him all their power. The main character, a, uh, I believe he's an al Qadiran merchant, who essentially the book follows, wants to help out Siric, but believes this is the wrong way to go about it. And he's just up front with Siric, and Siric's basically like, well, as long as he's getting the book, whatever, but he keeps doing things to ensure that he's gonna uh, follow the right course. There's so many memorable bits in here. There's this just disgusting scene where Siric, basically to put a geolocator on this guy, switches hearts with him. Siric's heart, of course, at this point is this disgusting, oozing black mass that gets shoved into this guy who, you know, he follows Siric, but he's like, ugh. The scene that I always talk about, tell people about, because it just stuck with me, it was so upsetting, is there's this scene where a follower of a different god, I can't remember which one at this point, but I think it's a good god, is trying to get information from the main character, and he's torturing him to do so, because he doesn't believe him, of course, because his whole story is kind of ludicrous. It's like, I follow Siric, but I'm not doing what he's doing, even though he knows this, and I'm the Seraph of Lies. So, of course, why would you believe the Seraph of Lies, right? But this guy is forced, compelled to always tell the truth, so he cannot change his story to anything that might even be slightly more believable. So he's tortured for a really long time by being dunked in a, uh, a tank with electric eels. It's just disturbing to read, not so much because, you know, that's the most horrifying torture I've ever heard of, but how terrible would it be to be tortured and know that you could not speak up, you could not even lie to save yourself. I mean, I, I don't know, that sort of powerlessness, 
I found really upsetting and just disturbing on all sorts of levels to be reading in a Realms novel. Don't get me wrong, I know I've been saying a lot like, this is surprising to find in a Realms novel. Don't get me wrong by saying I don't want to see these things in Realms novels, or I think it's too much or something like that. I'm, I'm glad that there are things here that are kind of unnerving me. And it isn't like we haven't had that forever, basically. I mean, as far back as Night Parade, I was talking about what it means to be a horror novel. I still consider Night Parade a horror novel first in a Realms novel second. And, uh... <laughs> Walter's Gate, man, if you want bloodshed. Yeah, so this book is just full of all sorts of stuff like that. We also see Kellum Vor finally 100% take on the persona of the Lord of Death. He puts a mask over his face. I think this is the first time he actually uses the mask. It might be at the end of book four, but he's pretty much completely gone, and he realizes he has to cut off all remembrances of mortality if he wants to be a good lord, because he has to be striving for balance now, not good, which is what he was striving for when he was alive. You know, the end of the trial, I mean, I don't think this is a huge spoiler since everybody knows Sirik is still around, like he's one of the instigators of fourth edition, essentially. The end of the trial is, of course, Sirik is let off because Mistra is basically, I think she and maybe Ogma are the only ones who vote against Sirik, saying that he stepped out of line and should be replaced or whatever. Kellum Vor also, I can't remember if he votes for him or if he just abdicates or whatever, but essentially he doesn't vote against him and Mistra is like, you know, Kellum Vor, what happened? happened to you, you know, he used to be a panther and we'd cuddle and it was awesome and he's just like, look, bitch, like, we aren't humans anymore. Stop acting like it. And Mistra finally kind of gets it at least somewhat at the end of this book. Though, of course, we, we, I think we see in future stuff that she's still much closer to her humanity than maybe is good for her. I think it's been three, maybe even five years since I've read this book. Not four. I don't know why I left out four there, but it's been, it's been quite a while, yet it's still is pretty vibrant in my memory. Different parts of it that really affected me. You know, I can't remember exactly what it was that the main character, I can't remember his name, obviously, I can't remember exactly what it was that he wanted the uh, Saranashad for, but uh, I, I remember he thinks Sirik is going too crazy and he's going to kind of pull him back from the edge somehow. You know, I, I can't remember specific little details like that, but there are scenes that stick out in my mind as just being, like, awesome, and they are the things that really drive me to read this entire series again, the Avatar series, uh, because I know where it leads, and I know that it just has this amazing final part. So, yeah, uh, Troy did just a genius when he's firing on all cylinders, and this is an excellent, excellent book, and I highly, highly recommend it. I think this is by far the best out of the five, and well worth looking into. It's exciting to end on a high note here. We'll be back next time for the year 1370. Is that right? Could that be... <laughs> Right? We're actually into the 70s? Yes, we are. Insanity. We got through 1369 so fast compared to 1368. What's going on? Will the trend continue? I'm gonna guess not, because we're gonna get to the uh, Sembia stuff here pretty quickly, and that's gonna take forever. But we're almost to third edition. How exciting is that? I, I guess I keep saying that, but it feels like we're almost there, because that essentially happens 1371, 1372, right about there. So we're almost there. Very exciting times. All right, I'll see you next time on Realms Remembered. This is Michael T. Bradley.